si vous deviez choisir vous-même l'époque, la peinture, la toile qui devrait vous survivre, est-ce que quelle serait cette toile, quelle serait je cette période sais pas, Je ne sais pas, c'est difficile. C'est fait avec des intentions euh, tellement du moment, de l'époque et de l'état dans lequel euh, tout le monde et moi nous nous trouvons. Picasso. I wonder what you think of when you hear that name. The most famous artist of the 20th century, the notorious womanizer who loved obsessively exploring his passion in tens of thousands of paintings, drawings and prints, or the cunning Spaniard who stored away thousands of artworks during his lifetime as a sort of diary, treasures that wreaked havoc in the art world and among his family after his death. There are so many questions about the artist, and some of the answers lie here in Paris's Picasso Museum. Opened in 1985, it has the largest collection of his works in the world. It's been closed for five years for renovations, but now, after many delays, the doors are open once again. Can you explain why the biggest collection of Picasso is in Paris and not in Spain? Well, it's because Picasso was in France. He died in 1973. And you know there is a specific law in France where you can pay taxes with works of art. And thanks to this law, there is this wonderful collection. Why do you think Picasso was attracted to Paris in the beginning? Because, sorry about that, but in the beginning of the 20th century, Paris was the center of the arts. Perhaps it's finished, except for this fantastic week with the Fondation Louis Vuitton, La Monnaie de Paris, the Musée Picasso, La FIAC, everything all together. It's a reminder of this fantastic period of the beginning of the 20th century. And what are your hopes for this museum? My hopes are very clear. Uh, I just want people to be happy because in such a context of economic crisis, I think this kind of museum can be a paradise, can be a place for quiet moments just to look at wonderful masterpieces. This place is brimming with masterpieces. The Celestine was painted in 1904 and is part of Picasso's Blue Period, which started when a close friend of his killed himself. The woman with the evil eye is part of Spanish folklore and is a clue to Picasso's imagination. He thought his art could change reality, that it was a kind of spell. The luncheon on the grass was painted in 1960, when Picasso was nearly 80. He takes Manet's masterpiece created 100 years earlier and plays with it. Even at the end of an illustrious career, the competitive old Spaniard needs to prove he's as good as his predecessor. Tell us about this room, because it's quite special, isn't it? This room is a kind of introduction. It's the second room of the inaugural exhibition. There are several self-portraits and very masculine portraits that were painted by Picasso throughout his career. Here we're in 1901 and here in 1972. Basically, this one room encompasses the entirety of Picasso's work. The young ladies of Avignon is said to be the first and greatest um, masterpiece of modern art. This room is dedicated to it. Why did it change everything? In the 60s, Picasso said to André Malraux about this painting, this is my exorcism painting. That's when Picasso left his fears behind. He was a superstitious man. He was scared of death, of painting challenges. The young ladies of Avignon forced him to cross the line. It's a great piece of work that drew a line on his own past and pushed the boundaries of painting. Eroticism appeared early in his work and never left it. A lifelong obsession with women, Fernanda, Eva, Olga, Marie Therese, Dora, Françoise, Jacqueline. Of the seven most important women in Picasso's life, two killed themselves and two went mad. Yes, although Picasso had affairs with dozens of women and was true to none of them except possibly the last, each of these seven plays a crucial role in his development as an artist and each represents a different period in his career. Just as they became obsessively involved with him, so he was dependent on them. None more so than Marie-Thérèse Walter. 
Picasso met her when she was 17 and kept her secret from his wife for eight years. Her first appearances in his work are in code, as a guitar waiting to be played, the boomerang-shaped collar and cuffs she brought the day they met, and her initials. Picasso was more in love than he had ever been. We are on the right bank in Ile Saint-Louis, where my grandfather installed uh, Marie-Thérèse and their daughter Maya, and this is where uh, the little family spent most of the years during the war. How well did you know your grandfather? Oh, I didn't know him. I was too young. So I was not really missing my grandfather. He was, he was present in my life. At home we had paintings, artworks, a few photos and memories. And did you realise who he was? How important he was? I knew my grandfather was a painter, but I didn't know he was so important. The day of his death, I realised he was important for everybody, all over the world, and I suddenly got answers to questions I never wondered about. I think he was a bit of a rogue when it came to women because he caused quite a lot of suffering, didn't he? You know, they were probably uh, um, victims accepting the situation. It's quite a miracle when you imagine that at some point you're going to be eternal in a museum on a wall. Most of Picasso's works are snapshots of a particular moment in his life, except for Guernica, which he painted in his workshop on this street in 1937. For the first time, he forgot himself and focused on the agony that was going on in Republican Spain. In fact, Pablo Picasso is not a painter of abstraction. He's a figurative. He needs a person, a landscape, objects. But in 1937, when Dora Mar showed him the pictures of Guernica, this little village in Spain, he discovered the horror of war, the attack on civilians by the army of Franco, helped with the, by the Nazis. And um, that day, he realized that politics was back. He was now awake and he was ready to fight against fascism. And this was actually where he worked? Yeah, in 1936, he needed a new atelier in Paris. And Dora Mar, he met a few months before, suggested this place which was a, a symbol, because not only uh, Pablo was the next um, occupant, but it was also where Balzac was uh, imagining one of his novels, and uh, it has been since uh, a place of memory, because she was very uh, cherished by nature. <laughs> and Saint-Germain de Prey were sort of the centre of the universe for artists and intellectuals at the beginning of the 20th century. What role does this area and this cafe play in Pablo Picasso's story? In fact, when my grandfather, Pablo Picasso, arrived in Paris in, uh, and established in 1904, it was in Montmartre, where everything was happening at that time, with all the artists becoming his friends, like Braque and uh, many others at Bateau Lavoir. But then, with success coming up, my grandfather moved to Saint-Germain and Café de Flore was a kind of uh, headquarter of the modern spirit. And do we see Saint-Germain-de-Prés in his work? The atmosphere of Saint-Germain is really visible in his painting because at some point it reflects the happiness of the moment, at some point it reflects the darkness of the situation because after La Belle Époque and Les Années Folles, it was a different period for France and for Paris, especially before the Second World War, when it was a situation of fascism, in, even in France. And uh, you can see in his paintings how much he was influenced by the meeting, by the relationship, by love, but also by war. learn about Picasso, the more questions there seem to be. His essence can still be felt here in Old Paris, and thanks to the reopening of the Picasso Museum not far from here, the chances are that essence will never leave. <laughs>